All right, so welcome everyone. It is a great pleasure to have you join us um, today um, for a virtual meeting hosted by NCSL's post-secondary education program. My name is Sunny Day. I am the program director for NCSL's post-secondary education team out of our Denver office. I'm very pleased to moderate today's discussion about the critical role of community colleges during and after the pandemic. Without a doubt, the affordability and accessibility of community colleges is and will be vital for vulnerable victims of this enormous job loss our nation is currently experiencing. Today, we will walk through some of the current stresses on community colleges, the role of community colleges in local workforce development and steps policymakers can take to strengthen credit and transfer policies as people move among institutions. Let's move to the next slide. Before we start, we'd love to do a quick round of who's on the call via the chat box. Um, and if you would, please enter what state you're from and take a guess um, at which state capital is um, in this picture here. And isn't that wonderful that there's musicians out front? Love it. Ooh, good guesses. Okay, great. Um, we'll, we'll check back in a second and see. It looks like um, some really good um, guesses. Okay, um, let's move on to the next slide, Andrew, please. Um, here's the agenda for today's meeting. We, um, we uh, oh, I wanted to let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded. We will upload links to the PowerPoints used today, the materials we refer to, and, are, and it'll all be on NCSL's YouTube channel by mid next week. Um, so, and, and let me just, um, okay, so right, so <laughs> today we'll talk about, as I mentioned, an overview of issues facing community colleges, you know, prior to, during, and now, and after the pandemic. Um, specifically, we'll talk about that critical role of community colleges as providers of workforce education in this uncertain economy. Uh, we'll talk about tackling the transfer pipeline. It's such a critical issue for students and their um, success um, and their timely graduation um, and or earning of credits. Um, we will have a little time for questions at the end. So I do welcome you all to, um, to type your questions in the chat box. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you a preview of a few more upcoming meetings we have um, because people would really love to have you continue to join us um, for this series that we're doing on post-secondary education issues during the pandemic. Sonny, okay. can I uh, bug in just for a second? Andrew, do you wanna run back to the um, last slide and we'll, we'll tell everyone who, <laughs> so, so a lot of you guessed, this is Wisconsin. And I was there that day and it was really lovely. All right, great. I think everyone has been admitted from the waiting room. Very good. So with this, let's go ahead and transition to today's conversation. Um, I'm glad to introduce our speaker, uh, first speaker for the meeting. Um, each of the three speakers today will spend some time providing their perspective on how community colleges can meet the moment and really help students and states get through the pandemic and come out stronger. I'm very pleased to start with Nikki Edgecombe, Senior Research Scholar for the Community College Research Center at Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Edgecombe recently published an opinion piece about adequate and equitable state funding for community colleges, including how post-secondary budgeting might be used as a tool to address systemic racism. And you can find that opinion piece uh, by following this link here. Um, I have asked Dr. Um, Edgecombe to give us a picture of um, what community colleges are dealing with right now. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Sunny. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, my name again is Nikki Edgecombe. I work at the Community College Research Center. Um, I am really glad to, to speak to you all. I feel like, you know, since we've been on lockdown, I really haven't had a chance to interact with all the audiences I'm used to interacting with. So it's really nice to actually be able to, to talk to um, policymakers and those operating in the state policymaking space. I do 
I am afforded a lot of opportunities to check in at the institutional level. Um, community colleges are our partners in, this, in the work that we do, the research we do. Um, but I oftentimes don't actually get an opportunity to reflect what we're learning back um, to the policy community so directly. So um, excited about the opportunity uh, to talk to, with you today. Andrew, we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to start kind of thinking about, I, I think it's critical when, when we're talking about the community college sector to recognize that, to understand and make the, the most, to really kind of have the most generative understanding of the community college um, space from a state policy perspective, it, it requires first a, a strong grounding in their complex missions. So, you know, I'm, I'm entering this conversation assuming a, a certain level of familiarity with community colleges, but I, I'm going to dig into a couple of elements of their mission that I think become particularly critical um, in the times we find ourselves. The second piece is, I think, it, it requires stronger awareness of both the intended and unintended consequences of policy in, in our current context, and in particular, um, an awareness of the policy, the types of policy guidance and the resources that community colleges need to fulfill um, their, their complex um, but critical missions. So I just want to start with a, a more general picture of community colleges and, and hone in on a few areas that I think are particularly important. I think where we find ourselves today, it's critical that we think about how we are going to sustain and frankly elevate the mission of community colleges, um, given where we find ourselves from a public health and economic standpoint. Um, I think about that through the lens of three of, of the sector's um, kind of critical components of their mission. One is their open access. So these institutions are intended to be gateways to post-secondary and not um, erect a lot of barriers in, in, in their challenges we have um, to getting students in and gaining academic momentum in their chosen program of study. But, I, you know, I just think it's critical to, to acknowledge the scale at, at which community college, the community college sector operates. It's breathtaking, right? 40% of all undergraduates, that's a plurality of undergraduates in this country. That's about 11.8 million. That number, off, that number oftentimes gets underestimated because um, if we go to our traditional ways of gauging community colleges, um, the many, many community colleges that now offer baccalaureate degrees um, have been knocked out a lot out of a lot of the counts. So it's really critical to take a, a, a closer look at the proportion um, of students that are enrolled in these institutions. Um, they are home to over half of the Latinx uh, undergraduates in the country. Um, about four in 10 black undergraduates go to community colleges, about a third of first generation college goers. So you see my point, we're, we're talking about um, institutions in a sector that have provided a gateway to post-secondary education um, in ways that other sectors within higher education aren't able to do. Um, and one of the linchpins of that access really is, is um, dependent on their affordability. So our Community colleges um, cost on average from a tuition and fees perspective about a third of that of our four year colleges um, and universities. The web, another way kind of to look at it from the other side of the ledger, they um, spend less on um, a lot of services. And even if we simply took the instructional programs, um, unfortunately, the disparity between the spend that's happening in community colleges and even other broad access institutions is um, uh, uncomfortably large. And I think there's a lot of important questions that as um, policy thinkers, we need to, to, to better understand and, and think about how we can address those, those disparities. So while these institutions are um, quite affordable in the aggregate, and you know, these 
these tuition fees can vary dramatically. They are very low in a California, they are higher in a Texas, but I think, you know, you can understand sort of the differences um, between the community college sector and some of the other sectors. While, while the, the, the sector um, prioritizes affordability, we still have about over six in 10 of our full-time students working while learning, and that number is about 74% for our part-time students, right? So this is a group of students who are um, figuring out how to navigate um, in, many in many cases, uh, full-time employment, sometimes with full-time schooling, sometimes with part-time schooling, right? So um, if you think about from the inter institutional perspective, what policy gui guidance is gonna be supportive of um, helping institutions to support students who um, are operating kind of with this characteristic, this work and earn strategy, uh, a learned strategy, and how do we think about um, supporting um, them effectively? Lastly, I think one of the critical elements of community colleges and what makes them a little bit hard to tie down sometimes is that they provide multiple pathways um, to college and employment goals. And Tamara and Chris, I think, are going to talk about some of those pathways um, that students take. But just to sort of set the stage, about 53% of community college students are enrolled in programs that um, are called credit or sometimes academic programs. This could be anything from the Associates of Art degree that's the, the foundation of a transfer degree to a, a program, an associates program in a career and technical education field. Um, but critically, these institutions also um, have about 47% of their enrollment in the non-credit side. And the non-credit side, I think, is getting a lot more scrutiny now for, for a number of reasons. One, it's a space where institutions oftentimes um, uh, support things like English language learning, uh, high school equivalency, um, short-term workforce credentials. Um, but they're also uh, historically not necessarily well integrated with the academic program. So colleges and systems are thinking a lot about how we support stronger alignment between non-credit and credit, because if a student who enrolls in an ESL program is warmed up to college, we don't want to create obstacles to their matriculation into academic programs. Okay, next slide, Andrew. So where does this kind of multifaceted mission put us um, during the COVID crisis? And not surprisingly, um, the COVID crisis is putting a, a range of, of unique pressures on community colleges and their core mission. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of pieces that I feel like tend to pop out um, at a time like this. The first is around um, the need for academic, elevated need for academic and non-academic supports. I think we've all seen in um, the media coverage and, and research that has been done on the pandemic that its effects are differential, right? So they are not affecting all populations in the same way. Well, if you think about the students who are enrolling in community colleges that I talked about on the last slide, you can um, uh, assume that you may be dealing with a disproportionate number of students who may be affected by the pandemic itself either um, having experienced COVID or have family members that have um, experienced or perhaps died um, as a part of the virus. Um, so the emotional toll that that is taking on students is considerable and something that we have to, to weigh. Um, the other element that I think is important is to think about obviously the, the workforce dislocations, right? So we, we've seen what kinds of jobs, what kinds of industries have been most severely affected by the pandemic and it's critical to to understand that that maps quite well with some of the employment that that 64 percent of um full-time students and 74 percent of part-time students had relied on in order to support themselves as part of their education um the chart i have in here i think is illustrative because it it highlights that you know in some cases we have 
um, half of low income students, and we know there's a lot of convergence between categorizations of income and those of race as well, but half indicating that the, the pandemic has had a strong or extremely strong impact on their emotional or mental preparedness, right? So how are we thinking about policy that supports the functions within institutions, advising, um, personal counseling, uh, other basic need support um, that would be available to students as they return um, to schooling, whether it's on campus, campus or virtually. And then pretty consistently, we have about a third of students indicating that their academic preparedness has been impacted. So what does that mean about how we're thinking about academic supports like tutoring? Um, uh, writing centers, math labs, other important resources that we're increasingly understanding are vital to propelling students in terms of their academic um, momentum. Um, the other challenge I'm going to highlight here is, is simply around the shift to remote learning. I think one of the important anecdotal takeaways I've had from my many conversations with colleges is while a lot of colleges do aspire to bring back students to campus, there is a point where they are understanding that this may reflect a change in their model. So there is a stronger inclination to sustaining hybrid instructional delivery um, moving forward. And we're having to think about how we support students to navigate that. In particular, in this chart, this is some work that McKinsey did across higher, the higher ed sector, but I, I wanna highlight uh, in particular the panel on the far right where while students uh, across the income um, levels indicate they feel a certain level of preparedness as new students in, in um, college um, to pursue it online. There is a large gap in terms of students having the hardware and software that they need to support that learning. Again, so as we've thought about federal policy in the CARES Act and dollars that flow through to students, I think there's a critical dimension here that we need to interrogate to ensure that even sustaining hybrid models are not exacerbating um, inequities that we know the system um, is already experiencing. Andrew, if we can go to my final slide. I wanted to end just talking a little bit about what I see are, are some paths forward. Um, you know, I think one of the things that has been important to think about with the pandemic is the critical um, lens that localness brings, right? So we know that the virus operates differently, even within a state, right? So we know in community colleges as local institutions, uniquely local institutions, um, are, are experiencing, you know, these various facets of the pandemic in, in different ways and having to navigate um, ways in which to support their students learning across, even within a state, um, but across, a, uh, across states as well. And I think there's a few opportunities that, you know, we're having to, we're beginning to see, and, and I think it's going to play out a little bit in the way we see our public higher education um, system uh, return to whatever our new normal will eventually be. Um, one important um, advantage that community colleges can have um, is assuming they are taking the proper health precautions, the non-residential nature of these institutions do better prepare them um, to sustain operations and allow students to return to campus. I was on um, a, con a call with an institution in Texas last week, and they were talking extensively about the ways in which they're supporting students' ability to return to low-density classrooms using hybrid course structures, requiring masks, providing sanit uh, hand sanitizer and other things, but, but with the recognition that all of the spaces where students had historically socialized were going to be closed off. Right, but the important thing and one of the virtues of the community college is these are considered teaching institutions. So that classroom, whether it's virtual or in person, in person has been a space where a lot of support, not simply instruction, but support is provided. So being able to um, uh, get back to that space becomes a vital asset for the institutions. 
as local institutions as well, they become particularly adept at being responsive to changes in local labor market demands. Now, we have, you know, we don't tend to go through inflection points quite as severe as what we had to experience with COVID, but you can imagine in an area where um, students who had operated in hospitality and let's say the culinary space have been dislocated um, are in a position to accelerate the reskilling if, for example, healthcare services has demand, right? So whether it's short-term certificates or other things, community colleges are, are particularly well positioned to support students in accelerating that kind of reskilling. And if it's not simply about the return um, or, or, or kind of filling that gap to ensure the continuity of employment, as a backdrop, a low cost higher ed um, uh, option, simply the exposure to the institutions may, um, may be able to drive and warm more students up to the idea of, of, of post-secondary education, perhaps beyond even just the short term. Um, and I think one of the things that's important here, and if we kind of think about our, our analyses of the labor market are telling us increasingly that about two thirds of jobs are requiring some level of post-secondary training. You know, we're, we're at a, an important kind of policy um, relevant space where we can think about rethinking what we're doing in that kind of post high school space, sub baccalaureate, but post high school space. And, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for us to reinvent earn and learn type models. I think one of the things that we're, we're challenged with is oftentimes folks not particularly familiar with the community at college space or the community college student will tend to have sort of a vision of the four year university type experience. And we don't necessarily weigh and think about the ways in which, how does this institution where three quarters of its um, part-time students are working, how do we take advantage and ensure that that work is supporting um, their development and their future career and educational prospects. So an opportunity to just reimagine um, our, our ways of thinking about how college and work can be combined becomes an important opportunity here. Now, I think the caveat that I would just leave you with is the community college space has um, done a lot of rethinking. It, it began to get exposure about, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago where people started actually paying a bit more attention to it. We were founded in 1996. It took a while for us to have a president actually call out community colleges in a state of the union. <laughs> but once we finally saw um, the, the sector and localities um, pay increasing attention, that also brought more scrutiny to our depressed completion rates. And so institutions have really done considerable work over the last decade to really initiate a number of institutional improvement efforts, whether it's a guided pathways model, trying to create more cohesive and well-structured programs that lead to family sustaining um, jobs that, that pay a family sustaining wage, whether it's developmental education reform, which has in, in acted as a, a de facto um, diversion from the access mission of these institutions. There's been a ton of scrutiny, and I know Kristen's gonna talk about it related to transfer and lots of complexities and challenges we still have to confront there, as well as workforce. The community colleges have been always connected to workforce, but I think there's strong agreement that there can be better alignment and better work. But none of this work, this tremendous work that's begun in the last decade can continue if these already under-resourced institutions are starved. So I think, and this is part of what, what um, the blog that Sunny talked about discusses, is in, in a time where we know state budgets are gonna be reduced, how do we think about who bears what cost? If these are engines of our economic recovery, how do we think about supporting them in ways that allow them to fulfill, the, fulfill their mission and support students to meet their own uh, academic and, and career goals? So I just think that that's an important consideration as we think about entering our appropriation seasons and we are thinking about what kinds of legislation 
are going to support the sectors within all of your respective states to really um, be important drivers of, ec of the economic recovery. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Edgecombe, for that wonderful um, brown kind of level setting for what community colleges are dealing with right now. And, um, you know, both setting the stage for the challenges and also some inspiration for us. So thank you. Um, I'm going to invite our next speaker to join us. The, uh, Tamara Jacoby is president and CEO of Opportunity America, which recently published a report by a group of educators and policy thinkers outlining a strategy for community colleges to step up in the wake of the COVID crisis as the nation's premier provider of workforce education. You can, so you can read her report using the link provided here. Um, and Tamar, welcome and thank you for being here. And to all of our participants, um, please feel free to just type in your questions as you have them. Um, so again, welcome Tamar, thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, and thank you National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Nobody matters more on most of the issues I care about. So it's, it's, it's really a pleasure and a great opportunity to be able to be with you today. So this is what I want to talk about. Community colleges as the nation's premier provider of workforce education. Um, what I'm going to talk about what community colleges currently do, what they could do, and what state legislators can do to help community colleges live up to their potential and meet this essential need for the nation. So let's start with the need. Let's start with the problem we're solving for. I'm sure I don't need to tell you, states are facing two huge workforce challenges. Number one, to get Americans back to work in the wake of the pandemic. Millions of Americans are gonna need fast, job-focused upskilling and reskilling to get back to work in the months ahead. Safety training, technical training, reskilling for a new industry. This alone could be the challenge of a lifetime. But the truth is, it's only the beginning. It's really only the foothills before the mountain because that giant leap of automation that we used to call the future of work is coming at us much faster now in the wake of COVID. The COVID economic shock is accelerating automation in industry after industry. I heard a McKinsey consultant talk about it the other day, so it must be true. Um, he said many things about the future of work that we thought would take a decade happened in a week in the pandemic. And the point is the digital revolution, artificial intelligence, robotics, they're not just transforming the economy, they're also transforming the way into the middle class. Technology is eliminating jobs, making it harder for many to reach or stay in the middle class, but technology is also creating jobs, in some cases, well-paying jobs. And here's the, here's the key, jobs that require some post-secondary education or training, but not necessarily a four-year college degree. So of course, this is already happening, right? It's been happening for a while. Um, it's hard to convey the significance of this slide. Um, Nikki sort of alluded to it. It looks like two pretty colored columns, right? But this is actually an epical transformation of the US economy. In 1983, only one third of American jobs required more than a high school education, right? One third. Today, only one third of American jobs are open to people with only a high school education. Today, two thirds of jobs require more than high school, some kind of post-secondary education or training, maybe four years of college, but maybe some kind of technical training. And just one more little gloss on this, another way to think of it is that technology and the digital revolution and the future of work are shifting the curve outward. Jobs that used to require a bachelor's degree now need a master's. Jobs that used to require a PhD now need postdoc specialization. And jobs that used to, where high school used to be enough now need some kind of post-secondary workforce education or training. So, you know, my point really here is that this is, not just we're not, we're not just talking when we talk about community college workforce ed we're not just talking about you know making a few tweaks to your state's vocational education this is one of the top policy priorities of our day responding to the new economy and the new educational imperatives it creates so the sixty-four thousand dollar question right is who's going to provide that workforce education and training that we need and the answer is there's no institution better positioned to provide it than community colleges. And notice I say position, not necessarily doing it yet. Let's be honest, community college, it's a vast sector, as Nikki outlined, 
qualities uneven. But community colleges have a lot going for them. They bring some important advantages to the task of workforce education. I'm just gonna talk briefly about four of them. Number one, community college, only community colleges have the infrastructure to provide the upskilling that's needed today. They have classrooms, they have instructors, they have training labs, they have online capacity, they're in every community, and it's where the students are. Uh, they, you, there are more students, um, Sorry, I don't have a term. There are more, there are more, in any given year, more people attend community college than participate in boot camps, government job training, and apprenticeship combined. I mean, a lot more. Look, those little bars on the top, they're stubby little, stubby little nothing. You can hardly see them compared to community colleges. But here's the rub. Nearly 80% of high school graduates arrive at community colleges saying they want to transfer and, earn a, and get to a four-year college and earn a bachelor's degree but only 15% make it, one five. I mean, this number says one three, sometimes it's one five. That's not a good batting average. 80% want, 15% get. Um, and don't get me wrong, a bachelor's degree in the right field is a golden ticket to the middle class, right? So good for that 15%. But even if we could double the number of learners earning bachelor's degrees, we'd still be leaving out half the student body. And the problem is that a lot of education reformers, and I was happy to see Nikki is not one of them, see this kind of as an either or. Um, you know, either we're going to improve transfer rates and boost BA attainment, or we're going to strengthen community college workforce education. And to me, that's just crazy. Um, it's not an either or, it's not a zero sum game, it's not a seesaw, one up, one down. Students need both things, both technical workforce skills and foundational quote unquote academic skills like critical thinking and problem solving. No matter where you're going, if you're going into the workforce, you need critical thinking and problem solving. If you're going on to four year college, you need some understanding of the workplace. We need both sides of the college. They both need to do a better job. Chris is gonna talk about boosting transfer rates. I'm gonna talk about how to elevate the workforce mission and what you policymakers can do to help colleges elevate the transfer mission, the workforce mission. So advantage number three, college's advantage as a workforce provider, they're nimble. And now I'm gonna talk about the non-credit division, which um, Nikki also laid out a little bit. Um, I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds if you're not familiar with non-credit education. Every college has a non-credit division. It's often as big as the credit side of the college. It's usually set a separate sphere, funded and administered separately. Students come to learn skills, not get academic credentials. Yes, there's a lot of ESL, adult basic learning and stuff like that, but increasingly it's about workforce. And the core strength of the non-credit division is that it doesn't need approval from a faculty committee or a creditor to stand up a new course. So the division can move at the speed of business. It can keep up with the way rapidly changing technology is transforming the workplace in sector after sector. The non-credit division also has its problems. Most important, it should be much easier to move from the non-credit division into the credit division. Nikki alluded to that as well. But the bottom line is that the non-credit division is a huge asset, often an underused asset at many community colleges. Advantage number four, um, community college have, has, have long experience with both kinds of learners who are going to need attention in coming years. Nikki didn't talk too much about this, but we've got traditional college age students at community colleges, right? And we have mid-career adult learners. Right now the balance is about 60-40, 60, 60 younger, 40 over, uh, older than 26. But COVID and the future of work throwing people out of jobs is, could change that ratio dramatically and we could be seeing a lot more mid-career adults. And the point is that community colleges know mid-career adults. They know their needs and they know how to meet their needs. Okay, so the next slide is a reform agenda. And in some ways, this is the most important slide, but my time is short, so I'm gonna, and I wanna get to policy, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. Reform number one, for, and this is what should happen at the college, right? This is the reform agenda at the college. Um, number one, take your cue from the local labor market. Um, this is the number one difference between community colleges and four-year institutions, or should be. Traditional higher ed is pretty much inward looking, focused inward. They live it, living up to its own intrinsic academic standards. Community colleges that want to live up to their potential as workforce education providers should be outward looking and responsive to the labor market. There are two ways to keep abreast of labor market need. Number one is labor market information. 
real time, granular, sector by sector, job by job, labor market data. The other way is much better, much closer, much more intensive, much more granular, same word again, uh, relationships with employers than many colleges currently have. But never mind, beyond the how, the bottom line here in this kind of this first bullet is that community college planning and decisions should be driven by the trends in the local economy. Programs, credentials, strategic initiatives. If these colleges want to be the workforce provider, programs, credentials, strategic initiatives should all grow out of and serve the region's workforce needs. Reform number two at the college, short form, uh, just in time job training. Most community college, traditional college age and those mid-career adults are in a hurry. Particularly today in the wake of COVID, they're in a hurry to get to work or to get back to work. They may come back to college later in life, as Nikki described, for more education. But what they want right now is a fast track to a well-paying job. And this means, and this means job-oriented courses should be short and laser focused, no longer than is necessary to learn the skills you need on the job. Reform number three, and now I'm edging into policy, right? We need a better metric. For a job focused program, the finish line isn't graduation or shouldn't be, it's job placement. Um, and community colleges that put workforce education more at the center of their mission should be held accountable for employment outcomes. So I haven't done justice to these institutional reforms, but the point is what's needed at community colleges goes beyond a, an innovation here and an innovation there. To meet today's workforce needs, to live up to their potential, potential, community colleges need a paradigm shift. In the wake of COVID, as we wrestle with the future of work, community colleges have an opportunity to embrace a new mission and a new identity, to accept and champion that they're the nation's premier provider of job-focused education. And many are moving in this direction. Some of the most exciting innovation in higher ed today is on the workforce side of community colleges. But they can't do it alone. They need your help. So the last slide, the most important slide, is what state policymakers can do, uh, to, can do um, how you can help community colleges live up to this potential. Five ideas, I'll just run through them quickly. Funding based on economic value added. So if the core mission of the college is to create a talent pipeline for the region, shouldn't the funding incentives um, shouldn't there be funding incentives to ensure that programs are aligned with regional economic needs? Put this another way, why are we paying the same amount of dollars for a credential with no labor market value as we pay for programs that prepare students for high paying, high demand jobs? A potential model for what can be done to move in this direction? Um, North Carolina tiered FTE funding um, programs that prepare learners for what um, North Carolina has determined are high priority economic value add occupations get more formula funding than other programs that don't prepare people for good jobs. Reform number two, outcomes based funding with workforce metrics. I think most of you agree we want to reward high paying programs. We want to create incentives for performance. So let's make sure the metrics we're using to measure value reflect the mission of the program. If the college's mission is to prepare students for the workforce, the outcomes-based funding formula should center on jobs and earnings, not graduation. Potential model for this, it's kind of radical, is the Texas State Technical College form formula. 100% of the college's funding goes up and down with learners' earnings in the first five years after they graduate. Um, potential ref state reform, state step number three, integrating community colleges and the public workforce system. Why does the US have two overlapping and duplicative job training networks, community colleges and the public workforce system? I don't know if you can answer, tell me the answer to that. You, you win the prize. Um, these two systems need to work together much more closely. We're not saying abolish any one of them or we're not saying merge them, but they need to work together much more closely, complementing, not competing with each other. And only state policymakers can make that happen. Only the state can brave the college and workforce funding. Only states can create incentives for the kind of cooperation that's needed. Number four, and I'm rushing through these fast, obviously, right? Hope you have questions. Number four, um, funding for attainment of industry certifications. Same point, let's reward desirable workforce outcomes and also provide a fu some funding for quality non-credit programs. 
A potential model is Florida. Florida colleges get a cash payment for every student who earns a certification. And believe me, certified students, the number of certified students in Florida has skyrocketed since that policy was put in place. Last reform is a common course numbering system. It's a little complicated to explain in the time I have, but you can imagine it's a key tool to ease any kind of transfer or articulation of credit. And it's especially important to ease that critical transition from non-credit to credit if people want to go from the workforce side to a later academic education. So I'm out of time. But if you want to learn more, please do go to our website and download the report or go to now, I guess you can go to Sunny's website, go to Sunny's website or our website and download uh, the report Sunny mentioned. It is the product of a leading group of educators and education policy thinkers. Um, what you heard today is the cliff notes. This is the 100 page, you know, the whole story. Um, and I'm also happy to follow up with anyone one on one. I'm eager to learn more about your system, happy to answer any questions you have, eager to help in any way I can. If you're considering moving in this direction that I believe is so important for learners and for the economy, leveraging the potential of community colleges to boost learners' upward mobility and enhance the state's economic competitiveness. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Tamar, and um, without a doubt, this is an issue that we're hearing increasing interest um, from legislators and legislative staff. And so we too are here to serve. Um, if you have questions about what other states are doing or legislative examples, perspectives, we're happy to provide that and also connect you to Tamar and her team. Um, same with our other speakers today. Um, I see we do have a great question and I'm excited to hop into it, but what I'd like to do is ask our final speaker to talk first and then we will um, come back and have a discussion at the end. Um, because this is kind of that last piece that everyone has mentioned today. Um, you know, the critical role that transfer policies play in states to help students complete their degrees. Um, and so I'll let him kind of speak more broadly about this issue, but know that this is something that states um, are continuing to work on and chip away at, and we do have some neat examples. And so um, it's an important topic. So our final speaker today is Chris Soto, who currently serves as Director of Innovation and Partnerships at the Connecticut State Department of Education. Um, prior to joining the department, he served as legislative director for Governor um, Ned Lamont, as well as serving as state representative in the Connecticut General Assembly. Chris also is serving on the National Tackling Transfer Advisory Board. And you can read an opinion piece he contributed to using the link provided here. Um, and Chris, thanks so much for being here and sharing your thoughts um, with um, folks um, kind of knowing the seat that they're in as state legislators. Thank you. Thanks, Sunny, and thank you to NCSL and also um, our previous speakers who I think set this up perfectly for my remarks. Uh, again, you know, I, I come to this from a legislative standpoint, having served in the legislature and then also um, on the governor's side, but also from the community-based, um, you know, history that I have and just kind of seeing firsthand students and family, you know, circuitously navigate through this, this windy process. And so I think that that definitely informs a lot of my work um, and perspective. You know, as Sunny mentioned, we're, we're kind of trying to tackle, as the title of the group says, uh, tackle transfer policy. And that's a partnership with the Aspen Institute, SOVA, and HCM strategists. And the goal there is to basically improve transfer outcomes for bachelor seeking students who begin at community college. So, you know, I'm going to definitely offer some of the ideas that we had in our in our opinion piece, but the work is ongoing and this board is basically is, is hoping to extract um, what we think might be some some good strategies moving forward beyond what we see as kind of the standard practices. Um, so let's start with what we know, um, you know, as illustrated by by my two colleagues on the call, the community colleges hold great promise for a variety of reasons. And, you know, just to use some of their words, you know, the advantages that um, a community college can have um, and you know they're positioned to be um, great institutions um, and so we know um, that they do have great promise but we also know that these systems are not achieving their full potential right that's exactly I mean that's why we're on this call that's why we're continuing to have this conversation um, but you know systems are achieving the outcomes that they were created to achieve Right. Think about that for a second. 
they're achieving the outcomes that they were created to achieve. And so when we think about community colleges, when they were created, um, they, it was under different circumstances, different objectives. Um, we, when we think about now, and, and I love the slides that Nikki had on who the community colleges are serving right now, can we honestly say that they're designed to support the students that enroll now? And that's a relative, you know, the answer is relative for everyone on this call. But my opinion is no. Um, and, you know, um, I think that's going to lead us to our next slide, please. And so um, the landscape around us is constantly evolving. And when that happens, this is what we get, right? Um, this piecemeal Lego creation of something and not what it was initially or intended or designed to do, right? And so COVID, you know, I'll use COVID as a perfect example. You know, again, a question back to the audience is, how many of your community colleges were ready to transition to an all remote environment and effectively deliver instruction at the flip of a switch? You know, again, the answer is relative, but that helps us think about, you know, their potential to be nimble, the promise that they have, but um, because we have created kind of these piecemeal solutions and piecemeal institutions that are trying to um, address, you know, challenges, they're not as nimble as they should be, right? They're not achieving their full promise. And so I think you see where I'm going here is that we have to honestly ask ourselves um, in our respective states, are we one proud of what we're doing? Um, or if not, then there's a two part answer, which is if we're not, you know, happy with, with the outcomes that our systems are producing, are we ready for, for bold change or are we willing to accept kind of a piecemeal approach? Um, because in the end, um, it's the students that are impacted. And that I think we always have to remember to be student centered and student centric when we think about this work. And so, you know, this can apply to what we're trying to tackle with transfer policy, but it, it spans anything that we're talking about in um, education, quite frankly, right? Are we happy with our outcomes? No, if, if yes, great, you know, raise those flags, wave those arms, um, pat your backs. But if not, are we willing, for bold ch will, willing to enact bold change or are we just okay with the status quo, right? Um, and so that, you know, that brings me to, to basically what we need to do to disrupt the system, right? Are we willing to basically blow up this Lego creation and create something that is truly going to serve the students that are enrolled? Or are we going to have a random, you know, walking ledge here on the side and then there's you know, I don't even know what that propeller is doing there. You know, that foundation looks a little shaky. Um, so are we gonna disrupt this, you know, and put it back together in the way that um, we really envision success or are we gonna continue with the status quo? And, you know, I know, believe me, um, I, you know, I'm not speaking from, from any high place because we have the status quo here in Connecticut and it thrives well. And, you know, just the simple example of our community college system. Um, and it's great that we have, you know, up, actually up until recently, and that's the example, you know, we had an independent system and that's great. They're, they're responsive to their communities. Um, and, and I think that that is definitely um, something that's important. But um, when we think about, again, system-wide change, is a fragmented system um, also going to be, um, you know, are we going to be able to enact system-wide change with a fragmented system? And that is the challenge that we're facing right now. And we actually recently moved to bring all of those institutions under one system. And that has caused a lot of consternation. And why? Because many think that that's happening at the expense of something else, right? And I don't have to remind this group in the audience what that means, right? Something is near and dear to a legislator's heart. Something is near and dear to a business that is connected with that college. It's maybe one um, 
one program that was passed in last session and everybody felt good and they were at the ribbon cutting and everybody's patting their backs. But that is what leads to this Lego monstrosity. Okay. And so, um, again, how far is your state willing to go to disrupt the system? And if the answer is not that far, um, then I think this is going to bring us to our next slide, please. So we, uh, a couple of colleagues and myself from the transfer, um, technical transfer advisory board, we recognize that this work is not easy. And, and we um, pen this up ed to talk about some of the best practices that we currently see, right? And so I'm gonna talk about you know, some of these four, some more in depth than others. I'm gonna check my time quickly because I can get passionate about this. Um, and so starting with the end game in mind, there has never been a better time, unfortunately, right? Because of COVID, but to rethink how we um, read, how we, do, um, how we do business, right? How we disrupt the system and make this about the students. With, cat, with states that are cash strapped right now, um, one important thing that we're gonna see is the redirection of funding. That's gonna be widespread throughout all public sectors. Education is not alone. And so when we start with the end game in mind, um, how do we position ourselves, this team, this audience, to make a strong case that investment in community college is what is vital, right? And I think that speaks to some of the, the things that Tamar was talking about when we link this to workforce development, because we know that um, workforce development is gonna be critical to you know, save states at this point right now, right? Um, you know, again, specifically with a COVID lens. And so we have to seize this moment to rewrite the end game. So that's, that's what number one speaks to. Um, and when I talk about moments, I just want to give one quick example and on how relevant this is. And so we recently passed a sweeping police accountability bill in the, in the, in the legislature um, that basically followed on the heels of, of what we saw in Minneapolis um, with George Floyd. There was no way that that bill was going to pass if, um, if we didn't see what we saw. And so that was a moment. That was a moment where the legislature had the political will to do something around police accountability. I would argue that COVID is our moment to rethink this work for community colleges. And so, um, you know, definitely, but the work now is on you to figure out what that looks like. How do you set the stage? And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And so catalyzing, inf uh, catalyzing innovation. This speaks somewhat to the redirection of funds, but more so, um, again, we know change is hard. And so when change is hard, um, and you do have to potentially redirect funds, how do you incentivize best practice? That is a more viable reality than one, getting more funds, because we know that's not the economic reality right now. Um, but if funds are going to be redirected, then you know, we argue that we should be incentivizing best practice. The third piece is around making financial aid more predictable. I'm not going to spend too much time here um, because we know, again, from ex I, I know from experience, I know you, I'm sure you guys know that this is an oftentimes confusing maze for students and families. I don't think anyone can basically raise their hand on this call and say, our families have it figured out on how to navigate the financial aid process in their state. And we know that finances is the main reason and you know under finances there is a variety of things that constitute that but it's the main reason why students don't finish their degrees and then lastly promoting transparency so back to my earlier comments about making the case we have to start with the data right data is the flashlight now local interests politics personalities they sometimes will overshadow the data but that doesn't mean that we don't need it Right again, it's the flashlight, but it's not the tool. The you know, and sometimes people mistake data as the tool to do the work, and that's not um, the key. So it's important that we make that distinction. So as your states are publishing, you know, no, not as, but are your states publishing institutional data that's disaggregated by race, um, by SES? You know, so here's the key, though. Even you know, so number one, if you're not publishing it, 
I think there, you know, we definitely have to get there as a best practice. But if you're not publishing or if you are publishing it, are you then talking about it? Because I've seen many websites that have beautiful dashboards with great metrics and graphs, but no one is talking about that data in actionable ways. And so lastly about transparency, you know, there's an, there's an element that really needs to be talked about between government and families, right? Uh, the average transfer student lost 13 credits in their transfer, according to the latest analysis. And, so, and depending on your cost per credit, you know, and, and using the national average here, that's $4,000. And because, um, you know, we know that many students use state and federal aid. And so not only are their students losing, uh, potentially if they put money into that, but also states and um, the federal government. And so we all lose out here. The last piece that we have to be honest about is this myth that do your two years, save money, and then go to four year school, right? You know, sometimes that, so that, you know, my opinion on this may not be the mainstream and, and you know, I'm curious to hear others, but do two years and transfer is not the reality for low income and first generation students, right? They're taking, they're starting with remedial courses, um, and there's a bunch of other obstacles that are gonna prevent them from graduating in two years. The student that typically graduates in two years is starting with five courses, right? They're not in any remedial classes, and they probably would have you know, gone on to, to any four-year school and done great, you know what I mean? So I think we have to um, change that narrative that everyone is just gonna go to community college, save money, and then graduate with a four-year degree. We just have to be honest about that because we know it's not the case for everybody. And so I'm gonna close with, by stressing these three points. Um, again, number one, transparency, uh, you know, with respect to data is where the conversation needs to start. Uh, we have to move beyond uh, the piecemeal, you know, Lego set and seriously consider disrupting the system in order to achieve the outcomes that, that are desired. And that's the creativity that's down there. And then lastly, the political will, which everybody on this call knows. Um, it's ultimately gonna, you can have the data, you can have the creative solution, but is there the political will to do what we know is gonna work best for students, even if it means um, we don't get the ribbon cutting anymore, even if it means that past programs that we campaigned on um, are no longer going to exist? Is the political will there to enact the creative solutions that are based on data and best practice. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. This has been so interesting. I really love seeing everyone's faces and the nodding and um, just such an important set of issues that you all discussed and reinforced and um, you know, again, we all um, as experts here today stand ready to um, serve any of you if we can make connections to other people. If there are folks that you'd like to have come testify in your state, um, let us know and we'll try to help make those connections or help um, provide examples. Um, I know that it's two o'clock, but I nonetheless think that we have just a couple of minutes and if the folks are willing to hang out for a couple of minutes, I'd love to address the Q&A knowing that not only are the folks on the line, um, listening and participating in this, but it will live on. Um, so I'd love to, to just take a few minutes to chat with some of the folks who have time. Um, and I certainly understand that some of you will have to log off. And so to those of you, um, thanks so much for joining. Um, so let me just touch base with the chat real quick um, and see where we're at here, because there were some good questions. Um, Let's start with um, a question that I know was um, directed for, I believe, for Tamar um, around um, the challenge that you pose. Um, is there a state that's doing the kinds of integration with the community colleges and the public workforce that you're talking to? Is there a state or two that you would point legislators and perhaps NCSL to? And you might be on mute. You're on mute tomorrow. There we go. Oh, nope, that's you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I knew that would happen, right? 
um, so sorry. Um, whoever asked that question, you caught the weakness in my talk because um, I had, if you notice, I had examples for every other state. I don't have a good example for that. I'm, I, I think it is probably happening, um, but I don't. I mean, and I guess I would first look. I'd probably first look at Texas. I might look at Wisconsin. I mean, there's a, pl a few places I would sort of think maybe would be doing it well that I would look. Maybe Utah, but I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, love to if you're you know interested in following up. It's something I'd like to explore further too. So. Um, good question. Sorry, I can't answer it. <laughs> yeah. Um, same. And um, then um, Sarah from Virginia shared the Virginia Career Works, the Workforce Credential Grant. Um, that's something NCSL has highlighted, if I think we're talking about the same program, um, kind of that fast forward program for um, adults who are um, wanting to quickly upskill. It's one of the most exciting things in the country. It's an amazing thing. Every state should do it. Uh <laughs> Um, I, thanks for for sharing it. I mean, I can I can talk about it if someone wants, if you would like that. But it may, there might be other questions. Well, let me say that NCSL actually has a brief on this, and we will put it with our resources, so I can point you to the legislation and kind of how that program has evolved over time. 